So this is what a typical compound pendulum question looks like. Uh, it is quite filled with a bunch of modeling assumptions, which is really good if you want modeling assumption revision. So a compound pendulum consists of a rod x, y of mass m and length 6l, which is attached to the rim of a disc of mass 3m and radius l. No overlapping occurs if both objects are coaxial. So that just means that they, uh, they're, they're essentially like infinitely thin. They're essentially laminae, um, but we're, we're just considering them to be as such. Obviously they're not gonna be, they're gonna have thickness, but everything that occurs is a log wood axis. The compact pendulum performs small oscillations about a horizontal axis through x perpendicular to the plane of the disc. First, they find a periodic time and the length of a simple pendulum with the same periodic time. So you can go ahead and attempt this problem if you want, or you can just wait for the solution. So I've actually copied the diagram onto a separate screen, so I'm going to just reduplicate it. So we have our rod uh, of length 6L. and then weight mg, we're assuming that this is a perfect object. And then we have our disc, radius l, and weight 3mg. So the way that I'm gonna denote this sort of stuff is to have capital C being the center of the disc, little c as an axis that is perpendicular to capital C, and then x as the axis, which is indeed parallel to c. So for the rod, we're gonna start off with finding the uh, moment of inertia about it, which is uh, proportional to ml squared, but and the constant for the rod is 4 thirds, so 4 thirds ml squared. And of course this becomes 3L because it's about the midpoint, which becomes, I believe, 12m squared, 12ml squared. <clears throat> now for the disc, we have that the inertia about this disc, which I'll actually keep around as capital I, is one half m or squared, which is one half of three m by l squared which is just 3 halves ml squared. Now we're gonna start doing some axis theorems. So the first thing I'm gonna do is the parallel axis theorem, which refers to the axis parallel to C and little c, which also in intently is perpendicular to capital C, which means it's parallel to X, because everything here is coaxial. And so we have that the moment of inertia about this or uh, I'm, I'm sort of um, I know I'm throwing random notations at but these two ix's are a bit different this I C is ic plus md squared so it's essentially the moment of inertia of the entire thing in a way And so this becomes 3 halves ml squared plus the mass of it is 3m and the distance from one point, one end of the rod to the center of the disc is going to be our d which is 7l squared. This is 49 times 3 plus 3 halves. Which means that I'll actually don't know whose ix are, is 297 over 2 ml squared. Now for the perpendicular axis theorem, we can say that i of the whole thing, so of, of the whole object, is the moment of, of, of this rod, which is 12 ml squared, plus uh, the moment of inertia technically of the disk, sort of on its own. So it works in a way as in from the end point to the circle as it is from the circle to the end point, which we can we have as our two two nine seven over two ml squared, which when adding is three twenty one over two 
ML squared. And this is the moment of inertia of the whole object. So, how are we going to work it from here? Well, we know that the periodic time is 2 pi times the square root of i divided by mgh. Now, h refers to the center of gravity, or, well, in a way. So we have to make sure that the potential energy on both objects is the same and to find out where it is. So you might intuitively think that it's right along the rim of the disk, but we'll just find out. So the net of this is going to be 4 mgh, so I'll just write PE. So the net thing of it is going to be 4 mg times wherever, it, wherever the center of gravity is. So 4 mgh is the potential energy of uh, the rod, which is uh, mg by 3L, plus the potential energy of the disk included. And so that's going to be uh, 3mg times 7L. So we're essentially taking it from the point where it's hinged, which I, I should have denoted as x at the beginning, but uh, whatever. So now that we have uh, 4 mgh is 3 plus 21 is 24, uh, 24 mgl. And so we can deduce that h must be 6l, which is indeed here. So this is going to be our center of gravity. Now I'm just going to have to move on to the next page for this. So we can say that the time is 2 pi times the square root of the moment of inertia, which is 321 over 2 ml squared, divided by the mass of the whole thing, which is 4 mg times 6l. Or, yeah, the mass is 4m times g times 6l. Now, of course, the masses are going to cancel. And one of these l's is going to cancel. Bringing the 2 down, we get, uh, well, 4 times the 6 is 24. And bringing the 2 down becomes 48. And this stays as 321l. And the g's are remaining here. which we can, I think, 321 is divisible by 3, it seems. Yep, and so that means that t is 2 pi root 107L over 16G seconds. So we finally found the answer to part 1. Let's find the answer to part 2 next. So if we compare... 2 pi root L over G equals 2 pi root 107L over 16G. We can just compare that this must be the same as this. And so we end up with the simple equivalence that the length of the equivalent pendulum is 107L divided by 16 meters. So a simple bit to the end, but it kind of knocks off from part one. So hopefully that explains it. I know it's a bit rushed, but it, it took a while trying to notate everything because it is these compound pendulum questions tend to be the longest of the bunch. So hopefully that sorts things out.